Sirs and ladies and gentlemen, this is day two of the workshop. Uh, we are able to see a lot of delegates joining us on day two. For their benefit, we would like to take a small recap of what went on yesterday and uh, what topics were discussed. For the friends who joined us only today, Yesterday, after the inaugural session, which was attended by uh, Honorable Chief Minister of Karnataka, Shri Sidharamaya, in the following sessions, in the technical sessions, Mr. Balachandran, Special Secretary in the Cabinet Secretariat Government of India, helped us understand the response to mass casualty, a perspective from 2611 Mumbai. Karnataka security, the current status, and the preparedness kind of issues presented by Shri M. N. Reddy, ADGP Land Order, Shri Alok Kumar, IGP Grievances and Human Rights, Shri Alok Mohan, ADGP ISD, Shri Ashit Mohan Prasad, Chief of Police Intelligence, and uh, Shri S. K. Patanayak, uh, ACS Home, in the chair and panel, Shri V. Balachandran. The most probably uh, a very picturesque and uh, momentous uh, presentation was from Mr. Sandeep Rathod who helped us understand the role of NDRF and the role they played in the Uttarakhand uh, episode. The role of media in national security was uh, delineated to us by Mr. Praveen Swami, journalist, editor, national security analyst on uh, CNN and IBN. This is what we had yesterday and uh, today we are ready with uh, day two. Today, the presentations lined up are Genesis of Urban Terror and its Manifestation in the Future. Second one, Incident Command System and the National Incident Management System. Third, Emergency Response to NBC Threats. That's going to be a panel discussion. And uh, fourth session for the day is Tabletop Simulation of a Mass Casualty Incident and a Detailed Briefing Session. These are the four sessions lined up for the day. And in the first session, we have Genesis of Urban Terror and its Manifestation in the Future. In the chair, we have Mr. Anand Arni, Farmal Special Secretary, Cabinet Secretary at Government of India. Welcome on the dry, sir, Mr. Anand Arni. Welcome, sir. And the presenter, Mr. Jing Sagnik. Hi, good morning. He is an analyst. Yeah. Welcome to put your hands together. Yes, thank you. Analyst, Institute of Terrorism Research and Response, Tel Aviv. For the benefit of friends who have joined only today, Mr. Ani, former Special Secretary of the Research and Analysis Wing, he was part of the hostage rescue team IC84 in Kandahar. IC814 in Kandahar. Mr. Jing Sagnik has worked in security management departments of several international corporations post-2003 Iraq, during which he was responsible for companies' business activities in insecure areas of the country. After relocating to Israel, he worked as a research assistant and language instructor at the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern and African Studies in Tel Aviv before joining ITRR. At ITRR, he was engaged in successful high-profile hostage extraction operations in the Middle East as deputy project lead. Sagnik's main field of research and writing at ITRR included efforts of ethnic and religious terror on urban life in major cities across the world, as well as counter-terrorism methods adopted by states. Sagnik's articles and personal interviews have been published in numerous newspapers, TVs, journals in Iraq, Turkey, and Israel. He is fluent, this is a very interesting part. He is fluent in English, Kurdish, Turkish, Arabic, and has a high level of comprehension in Persian. Over to chair to take the session forward. Genesis of urban terror and its manifestation in the future. Let me, let me just for the uh, audience give them a brief about you. 
last evening when I met him, uh, I asked him if uh, he was teaching Kurmanji, which is the language of the Kurds, uh, in, who are mainly in northern Iraq and other places. And then we got talking and uh, he told me that uh, I asked him if he's a uh, Zoroastrian and it turns out that he is. Interestingly enough when I told him that uh, we have a Zoroastrian community in Bangalore he was fascinated. Well that is a minor aside. Uh, his focus will be on terror. As we all know terror is, uh, is a word which has Latin and uh, comes from Latin and French origins. Means great fear. Today we have uh, enlarged that to mean terrorism, which means uh, the modern day definition is uh, the use of terror for criminal or illegal acts against the state or against any authority which is in power. The idea is to create fear. Um, he's going, uh, we are, we are in Bangalore is an urban city. This is something that we are going to be living with as more and more cities in Bangalore, in India, get urbanized. And the focus of this talk today will be on uh, urban terror. I must also say that when I look, went onto the net on urban terror, there's very little on urban terror. It's all about urban terror, a computer game. And um, we have now urban terror 4.1. But there's nothing else on this thing. And for that, we need Mr. Singh Sajnich to give us his views. Please. Thank you. Actually, I was not excited before coming here or before coming on the stage, but after these two fabulous introductions, I now feel excited to be here. Um, this is the first presentation of the Institute of Terrorism Research and Response Targeted Actionable Management Center uh, Department. I'd like to thank you all and Synergy and all other people that are hosting us here uh, on behalf of my team and I'm so glad and honored to be with you here in India for my first time in India, in Bangalore. And we hope that this, 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 this connection between us and between, between your country will continue and, and develop. Um, actually, I was introduced in a very well fashion, so I, I don't think it's any more needed to say anything about myself. Um, I would just underline I'm more a Middle East person with a focus on the Middle East and also an academic already writing a PhD thesis on, on Middle Eastern studies. And I'm currently heading the Middle East department at ITRR. Um, ITRR is a US Israel based intelligence company that is engaged in various operations all over the world, which vary from, from hostage extractions to to real-time coverage with, with actionable in intelligence. So any questions about the operations in Israel, I'll be delighted to answer. I've prepared a presentation, a short introduction of terrorism and its, and its urban side and how things has changed in in, in the field of terrorism from past till today. As you can see, I decided to start with a quotation from the former head of Shinbat, Jacob Perry, who said, terror is like water. When blocked, it will find another channel. And I'm sure all of us here have witnessed this reality so many times in our lives, say from from the screens of TV to our daily lives that we all witness terror. I remember when I wrote one of my essays when I was doing my BA, I, I said terrorism is not anymore the concept that was that's threatening states and military, but also hot dog seller in Manhattan. And this was just before Manhattan was hit in 9-11. The question if terrorism, a value-free concept, should be answered first. But whether the term where political sympathies affect interpretations of actions as legitimate or illegitimate, and the term terrorism is often meant to imply illegitimate actions. 
Therefore, its use will vary since different people can and will interpret and act differently depending on their perspective. Sympathies and they seek to obtain. Thus, the process of finding a universal definition quickly becomes a part of wider debate over values and ideologies. And the debate over terrorism's def definition is not solved yet. There are five general key factors that seem to appear in the countless definitions of terrorism. First, terrorism is not an ideology, but a method. It's a tool that players at the individual group or state level decide to pursue in order to accomplish their goals. Secondly, terrorism contains the promise of threat of violence to be delivered in a systematic and deliberate way in order to create terror, in quotation marks. The sole threat of terrorist attack is therefore terrorism itself. Thirdly, the seemingly random and unpredictable choices of victims, which are often directed at a wider audience, are civilians, and usually they are symbolic in value. Fourthly, in order to fulfill the tactical goal of terrorism, creating an extremely fearful state of mind in a wider audience, all above the factors, need to be, need to be combined and implemented altogether. When these four factors is achieved, terrorists are closer to accomplishing the ultimate, the fifth goal, which is the strategic goal namely politics. Terrorism is a violent form of politics. And precisely because terrorism is political, it represents such a complex danger. In addition to these helpful key factors that we mentioned, it is still useful to propose a working definition of terrorism for the sake of the thesis, which I would say Terrorism involves the deliberate killing and injuring of randomly selected non-combatants for political ends. It seeks to promote a political outcome by spreading terror and demoralization throughout a population. As this definition touched upon, terrorism has another vital aspect, namely the psychological side. The way to terrorists' ultimate political goal runs through a vital interim objective, the creation of a sensation of uncontrollable fear in the target community. Thus, terrorism is a means of installing in every individual the fear that the next terror attack may have their name on it. Terrorism works to undermine the sense of security and to disrupt everyday life so as to harm the target country's ability to function. The goal of this strategy is to drive public opinion, to pressure decision makers to surrender to the terrorists. Therefore, the target population becomes only a tool in the hands of the terrorists in advancing a political agenda in the name of which the terrorism is perpetrated. <clears throat> when seeking to answer the question of what terrorism is, the debate sometimes can turn to why terrorism appears in the first place. One can debate and make lists to hypothesize the root causes of terrorism or motivating factors behind acts of terrors. There exists a distinction between preconditions and precipitants of terrorism. Three main categories can be, can be explained here. Preconditions set the stage for terrorism in the long run whereas precipitants 
are the specific events or phenomena that immediately precede or trigger the outbreak of terrorism. Further, the various causes are structural causes, facilitating or accelerator causes, motivational causes, and lastly, the triggering causes. A list of preconditions of terrorism might include poverty, unemployment, religion, large gaps in societal classes, little or no press freedom, little or no personal freedom, disputes over land, area, and or sovereignty, and lack of recognized human rights. Additionally, a list of precipitants might include job loss, death of a friend or a family member, an arrest of a friend or a family member, hindrance of personal freedom, new direction of personal ideology, and the sense of stigmatization and loss of hope. Such perceived acts of injustice, regardless of whether they are unjust, depend on the intensity and duration of this feeling in one's heart. They are important in order to understand why an individual engages in acts of terror, and in this context, it becomes vital to act against the root cause of terrorism. These are also vital to identify potential terrorist subjects in our societies. In the past, terrorism was practiced by collection of individuals belonging to an identifiable organization that had a clear command and control apparatus, and a defined set of political, social, or economic goals. Radical leftist organizations, such as the Japanese Red Army, the Red Army faction in Germany, and the Red Brigades in Italy, as well as ethno-nationalist and separatist movements, such as the Abu Nidal organization, the Irish Republican Army, and the Basque separatist group, reflected the stereotype of traditional terrorist groups. They generally issued communicas, taking credit for and explaining in great detail their actions. However, disagreeable or distasteful their arms and motivations may have been their ideology and intentions were at least comprehensible, albeit politically radical and personally fanatical. Significantly, however, these more familiar terrorist groups engage in highly selective and mostly discriminate acts of violence. They targeted for bombing various symbolic targets, representing the source of source of the enemies, including embassies, banks, national airlines, carriers, buses, transportation, infrastructure, and or kidnapped or assassinated specific persons whom they blamed for economic exploitation or political repression in order to attract attention to themselves and their causes. However, today, the more traditional and the familiar types of ethnic nationalists and separatists, as well as ideological group, have been joined by a variety of organizations with less comprehensible nationalist or ideological motivations. These new terrorist organizations embrace far more amorphous religious and millenarian aims and wrap themselves in a less cohesive organizational entities with a more diffuse structure and membership. Unlike the specific, intelligible demands of past, familiar, predominantly secular terrorist groups who generally claimed credit for and explained, of and explained their violent acts, no credible claim for the attacks issued today. Indeed, the only specific information that has come to light has been a vague message taking responsibility for the bombings in defense of Muslim hollow places such as Mecca or somewhere in the Western world. The appearance of these in different types of adversaries 
in some instances, new motivations and new capabilities accounts largely for terrorism's increased lethality in recent years vis-a-vis -vis the changing concept today. The development of increasing lethality in terrorism has been mostly the result of a handful of so-called terrorist spectators. That is, the dramatic at attention riveting and high lethality acts that so actively capture the attention of the media and public alike. A number of reasons account for terrorism's increased lethality. First, there appears to be a pattern, sorry, First, there appears to be a pattern that suggests that at least terrorists who have, that ter terrorists have come to believe that attention is no longer as readily obtained as it was once. To their minds, both the public and media have become increasingly inured or decentralized to the continuing sprawl of terrorist violence. Accordingly, these terrorists feel themselves pushed to undertake ever, ever more dramatic or destructively lethal deeds today in order to achieve the same effect that, that they had in past decades. Secondly, terrorists have, have profited a lot from past experience and have become more adept at killing. Not only their weapons becoming smaller, more sophisticated, and deadlier, but terrorists now have a greater access to these weapons through their alliances with various rogue streets. Most of these alliances, unfortunately, include several states. Indeed, a third reason for terrorism's increased lethality and one closely tied to the, uh, to, to, to the points I mentioned is the active role played by states in supporting and sponsoring terrorism. The assistance that these governments have provided has often enhanced the striking power and capabilities of ordinary terrorist organizations, transforming for some groups into entities more akin to, to elite commando units than a, a stereotypical Molotov cocktail truing organization in, in 1960s and 70s. State sponsorship has in fact a force multiplying effect on ordinary terrorist groups. It places greater resources in the hands of terrorists, thereby enhancing planning, <laughs> intelligence, logistical capabilities, training, finances, and sophistication. Moreover, since state-sponsored terrorists do not depend on the local population for support, they need not to be concerned about alienating popular opinion or provoking a public backlash. The overall increase during the past 15 years of terrorism motivated to the most part by a religious imperative that, that encapsulates the confluence of new adversaries, motivations, and tactics affecting terrorist patterns today. While the connection between religion and terrorism is not new, in recent decades, the variant has largely been overshadowed by ethnic and national separatists or ideologically motivated national terrorism. I'd like to give example of a study that's made in past decade. None of the 11 identifiable terrorist groups active in 1968 could be classified as religious. Not until 1980, in fact, as a result of repercussions from revolution in Iran, 
the year before, in 1979. <clears throat> Do the first modern, in quotation marks, religious terrorist groups appear, although they amount to only two of the 64 groups, has in groups active that year. 12 years later, however, the number of religious terrorist groups has increased nearly sixfold, representing a quarter, which was 11 of 48 of the terrorist organizations that carried out attacks in 1992. By 1994, a third, which was 16, of the 49 identifiable terrorist groups could be classified as religious in character and in motivation. And in 1995, they accounted for nearly half, which was 26 of 40, 46, of the 59 known terrorist groups active that year. In 1996, however, only 13% of the 46 identifiable terrorist groups had a dominant religious component. Nevertheless, despite the decline in the 1996 figure, religion remained as a significant force behind terrorism's rising lethality. Groups motivated in part or in whole by a salient religious or theological motivation committed 10 of the 13 terrorist attacks recorded in 1996. In today's urban terror, religiously motivated terrorism is responsible for more lethal attacks than any other form. Terrorism motivated in a whole or in part by religious imperatives has often led to more intense acts or attempts of violence that have produced considerably higher levels of fatalities, at least compared with the relatively more discriminate and less lethal incidents of violence perpetrated by secular terrorist organizations. Very shortly, religious terrorism tends to be more lethal than secular terrorism because of the radically different value system and mechanisms of legitimization and justification concepts of morality and worldviews that directly affect the holy terrorist, in, co in quotation marks, motivation. For the religious terrorists, violence is a sacramental act or divine duty executed in direct response to some theological demand or imperative and justified by, by scripture. Religion, therefore, functions as a legitimizing force, specifically sanctioning wide-scale violence against an almost open-ended category of opponents. In example, all peoples who are not members of the religious terrorist groups can be called infidels or kafir or anything else, and this is a legitimizing factor for their killings. The implications of terrorism motivated by religious imperative for higher levels of lethality is evidenced by the violent record of various Shia Islamic groups during the 1980s. For example, Although these, or, those or, these organizations committed only 8% of all recorded international terrorist incidents between 1982 and 1989, they were nonetheless responsible for nearly 30% of the death during that time period.
Actually, I think we are approaching, or we have come, to the to the most most tragic development of of our times, that are the lone wolves, or amateur terrorists. The proliferation of lone wolves taking part in terrorist acts has also contributed to the terrorism's increasing lethality in past. Terrorism was not just a matter of having the will to kill and motivation to act, but of having the knowledge and the capability to do so. This needed training, this needed access to weaponry, and this needed operational knowledge. These were not readily available and were generally acquired through training undertaken in camps run either by other terrorist organizations or sponsored by, by, by states. However, today, the means and methods of terrorism can be easily obtained at bookstores, from mail order publishers, on CD-ROM, or over in the, on the internet. Terrorism has become accessible to anyone today, with a grievance, an agenda, or a purpose, or any ideological combination of all of these above. Relying on commercially obtainable bomb-making manuals and operational guidebooks, the amateur terrorists can be just as deadly and destructive and even more difficult to track and anticipate than their professional counterparts. Amateur terrorists, or the lone wolves, are dangerous also in other ways. The absence of a central command, I'm talking about terrorist organizations, central command, which is a pity that we are now looking for terrorist organizations to have central commands. And the absence of a central command may result in, in, in fever constraints for, on, the, on the terrorist operations and targets and especially when combined with a religious anger, fewer inhibitions about indiscriminate casualties can be expected. Finally, terrorism's increasing lethality may also be reflected in the fact that today terrorists tend to claim credit for the attacks less frequently. Unlike the more traditional terrorist groups of the 1970s and 1980s, who not only issued communiques explaining why they carried out an attack, but proudly boasted of having executed a particularly destructive or lethal attack, terrorists are now appreciably more reticent and silent. In postmodern terrorism, the act of the terror is not what terrorists are accounted for, is the number of the killings and, and our attention, our media attention and public attention. Examining the relationship between political parties and terrorist groups, we should conclude that the two must not have always be examined as, as, as separate entities. Political parties may turn, to terrorist, ter may turn to terrorist tactics, while terrorist groups may turn to the ballot box and, and achieve their goals in politics. The question is, when do terrorist groups turn to politics? 
There are two ways that this occurs. A group completely abandons violence in favor of the ballot box, or a terror group creates a political wing that functions alongside the military. The first type of transformation may occur if a militant group is invited to join the political system, as happened with the M19 of Colombia, who in the 1990s made the transition to, peaceful, to a peaceful party, which is also happening today in Turkey with the PKK. The second type of transformation in which a political wing is created may occur when political groups feel it needs to provide a front for its more political activities. Example of Sinn Féin as the political front for the I Irish Republican Army, or a better example of today could be Hezbollah of Lebanon. There's also a set of internal factors that, are, that, that push terrorist groups to turn to politics. These motivations for a terrorist organization to, 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 to turn to politics as depending on the degree of institutionalization and availability and growth or decline of mobilization resources, shifts within the political opportunity system and internal commitment to change. More specifically, that a group with terrorist aims is more likely to participate in elections and join the process, sorry, a group with territorial aims is more likely to participate and in, in elections and join the political process whether or not it gives up violence because political influence will allow the group to have larger stake in the territory that are pursuing for. There's also a set of external pressures on groups to change the politics, especially these set of factors were successfully achieved by, by the Turkish state suppressing religious and Kurdish terrorist groups. Among them are anti-terror operations that are conducted in a nationwide and usually effective on terrorist groups to turn to politics and see it as, 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 an, as an occasion to breathe, in quotation marks. Law enforcement, which is, which is how the state approaches terrorist organizations as, as criminal groups and enforce law on them. And disappearance of the antithesis, which means if an organization, let's take the Turkish example, a Kurdish religious jihadist organization that came into, came, came, that came into existence as opposed to the Kurdish secular terrorism, when Kurdish secular terrorism was was oppressed by Turkey, the, the latter, the religious reaction to Kurdish secular terrorism, again in a terrorist way, also changed its way, changes, change, change its path to a political agenda. And jihadist organizations today, especially that of that of base in the Middle East, have, have changed their modus of operandi, which is also another factor for them to, to, to pursue for political goals. First of all, it is a tested and proved method that grassroots support for poor is, or can be defined as the best way of recruitment for, for any organization. And as we said in the beginning of the presentation, that past experience of terrorist organizations function to, to, to condition their behavior today. And you can be sure that the grassroots food support or help for the poor is tested millions of times in millions of places and have always positive results. This is in the literature also called the Muslim Brotherhood strategy. I don't want to be misunderstood. Muslim Brotherhood is not a terrorist organization, as we know. But 
the strategy is, is, is usually adopted from how Muslim Brotherhood pursued a, a way to gain reputation through competence and honesty. And honesty in, in, in those societies, in our societies, especially at the grassroots level, is usually understood through, through providing aid. Who you can recruit for a terrorist organization is, is, the, is, is the question being asked by, by every organization. A middle class, a university student, or someone else? Today, we can say most of the jihadist organizations who are usually responsible for, for violence in our cities are aiming at underdeveloped areas. Contrary to leftist Maoist organizations that were aiming at university students, that were aiming at middle class people in, back in the 1970s and 60s. These underdeveloped areas are accessed by usually, again, um, 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 aid organizations, humanitarian organizations, and, and with humanitarian agendas. And usually these terror groups do not reveal anything about their political ambitions unless the person is being recruited to, to the organization. One of the ways for recruiting youths to these organizations are, are, are Quran courses and, and, and other religious gatherings in, in those underdeveloped areas where people definitely need hopes, which is provided by religious education with a covered political agenda there. I would also suggest to take a look at the mediations being, being pursued by terrorist organizations in underdeveloped areas. Mediation between, between families, between, between prominent figures, between groups, between other terror groups, and even between states and individuals over the disputes they have, over the disputes of, of territory, over the disputes of, of property, low, and, and, and etc. So, before going to this slide, I would also underline in a very friendly way that, that writing this presentation and, and presenting it here, the question my mind evolving is, can't all these be provided by us, by non-terrorist members of the society? by our states, by our governments? Can't we go and mediate between, between, between individuals and clans and tribes somewhere in the Sinai instead of Ansar al-Sharia from Tunisia go and, go, goes and mediates between them? We talked about the modus operandi, the action. <coughs> we have three simultaneous strategies that are available in each and every city of today's world used by Islamist organizations. I have these three categorizations of their, of their strategies, which vary between organization to organization, but these three are usually the most common ones. Tabligh, Jama'a, and Jihad. Tabligh is the propaganda, and no matter how it's done, it, it fulfills the job. If you do it through, through providing aid and you have the most smiling person visiting a poor house in, a, in an underdeveloped area, the propaganda is fulfilled. There's no need to openly mention the terror organization's name. Just an example, the, the, the Al-Qaeda faction of Tunisia and Saad al-Sharia is the most active organization in, aiding food, in, in providing food for underdeveloped areas. You cannot simply go to the, one of those areas and knock on the door of a poor lady and tell them and Saul or Sharia are bad. She has no idea about if they're good or bad, but she knows they are feeding her. So Jama'a starts with that old lady sitting in her poor house in Tunisia. Because Jama'a in, in, in Arabic means society, community. Terror organizations with political agendas, like that of religious organizations, have the ambition 
to create a new form of society. And if you look at the history, creation of all our states are, are again creating of, of, of societies. So terrorist organizations have an antithesis for, for what we have created in the past 100, 200 years of the modern times, which is the, the societies bound to law that we have today. But in the society that's, that, that, is, that, is, that, is, that, that is aimed to be created by, by terrorist organizations is the community, the jama'a that have pledged its biat, its loyalty to, to, the, to the organization's holy war and has become a, a part of a holy jama'a that is not bound to laws, that is bound to religious and slash or, 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 or laws created by, put in force by the terrorist organization. So this society exists within our societies for a further objective, which is jihad, the holy war. The holy war is not pursued only by militants. The holy war is set to be pursued by the jama'a, by the community, who first got, in, got stepped into the organization by receiving a pack of pasta, a pack of rice from the organization, and now they are going to be the, 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 the jama'a that is going to pursue the, <coughs> the jihad. So the hidden propaganda and overt propaganda are before and after creating the jama'a. Before creating the jama'a, the propaganda can be the hidden one. But after, creating, after the creation of the jama'a, after having your very own little or big society within a society, the propaganda can reveal itself. Thank you very much for listening to me, and I'm ready to answer any questions. Uh, there are any questions, but before that, I'd just like to have one, put one thought, and he, um, we must firstly thank him for an ex excellent presentation. And when he did come to that point where he spoke about lone wolf attacks, uh, this is one area which uh, I'd just like to leave one thought with all of you. I don't think, I don't think we have an answer on that. Uh, well, where does that tipping point between well, let's say that a lone wolf attack is that when a person has believes that the cause is strong enough to lay down his life for. Um, where do we go? Where, where is the danger is when that individual decides to move from a protest, a sign of protest, which we had in um, Arab Spring and other places, to uh, hitting at a specific target. Does, is there a cause for that? That's something that we have to study. I mean, we are, cannot be immune to this. We've had instances where people have set themselves on fire for reservations, for on language issues, states reorganization. Uh, when a man is angry enough to kill himself for a reason, or I mean, it may be petty to us, but uh, We've seen enormous amounts of uh, that happening in our own backyards. If that happens, where does this take us? When does this, does this cross over to a different type of lone wolf, different type of terrorism, different type of attacks? And this is something that in urban centers we'll have to be careful. Having said that, now let me now thank Mr. Seng, Jeng Sang Sanich for his presentation and open the floor out to any questions that you may have. May I may request that the questions be focused and precise.